morning, lead dev. If not you, then who? One of the best advices I received was many moons ago when I was a senior engineer at a mid-sized company. One of my colleagues came up to me and said, hey, Nimisha, you see problems? You have ideas. Well, instead of complaining, do something. I was strikingly reminded of what it means to be a leader. Yes, I saw that our organization was slowed down by, uh, you know, misalignment. And so what did I do? I start, got a group of people together. We started a book club on domain-driven design. We put a task force together, and then we moved forth. I also saw that our organization was slowed down by a tightly coupled ball of mud, our beloved monolith. And so at our next hackathon, we, I got a group of engineers together. Collectively, we thought of some ideas. And then at the first a chance that I got, I created a plug-in framework for our monolith. Yeah, why not? You know, our solid design principles, the monolith was closed for modifications and open only for extensions. However, now I wonder, did I fully consider the paths that were not taken? I mean, the monolith's life, because of that pluggability, was now extended. Instead, what if we chose composability instead? Because that could have perhaps been more aligned with the Django web framework that we were using. Or, if we didn't invest in pluggability, what if instead we invested in extracting the components out of the monolith? Then the monolith would be smaller in size than it is today. As technologists, we make technical decisions based on the local perspectives that we have, based on externally what the tech industry is doing, based on whatever fires we might be fighting at the moment. Unfortunately, our decisions can lead to unintended consequences. And let me tell you, many times, those unintended consequences they reach beyond just your team, beyond just technology, beyond your own organization. For instance, let's take social media. Social media is fantastic, right, in connecting culture and people, but they are also weaponized to marginalize individuals and to spread false information. What about remote learning? Remote learning was essential during the age of COVID, and it brings education to the far reaches of the world. But it also widens the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. AI, artificial intelligence, it benefits our society, but it is blunted if human biases find their way into our code. In urban architecture, the construction of a new highway, that can lead to a lot of advancements, but it can also isolate underprivileged neighborhoods. As John Anderson, the president of the National Academy of Engineering says, good engineering cannot be separated from social awareness and deliberate consideration. So going back to my own roots, there's a Sanskrit phrase called paraspagraho jivanam. It means bound together with interdependence. Interdependence. Interdependence that's far beyond our own human recognition. Our actions in this space-time can have impact on other space-times. And likewise, actions there impact us. Another root principle is satya. Satya at glance, loosely means truth. But if you dig a little bit deeper, it means truth that causes the least harm. Principles like these, they promote long-term thinking and reflecting on the impact that is much more far-reaching. From a systems thinking standpoint, 
real systems are interconnected. They are never independent of each other. You know, whether it be your heart and your lungs, whether it be Europe and Africa. Another component of systems thinking is purpose. And purpose has very high leverage. It can shift mindsets. Oh man, if you can shift a mindset, you can completely shift the system. So just imagine that power. For example, what if the purposes of our businesses was not competition? Not just profitability, but also humanity. That system that we live in today can shift away from that being in that endless rat race. So let's look at what other ancestors have to say. The Haudenosaunee, American Indian tribe, what was their purpose? Their purpose was that in every decision that they made, they considered the impact on the next seven generations. Not one generation, not two generations, seven generations. That's 525 years into the future. For them, they chose to create a world that is worth inheriting. We can thank them for what we have today. Of course, it's not an easy task. I understand, right? I mean, our world is too complex. It's very fast-paced. It's inherently unpredictable. You cannot control it. We cannot plan for it in the future perfectly. But as President Eisenhower told us, plans are worthless, sure, but planning is everything. And yeah, we can say, but our human mind is limited. It's, we're attracted by straight lines and thinking linearly. We default to thinking that change is linear. And so what happens? Well, we're surprised when all of a sudden the changes are happening. That seems very sudden, but though it's been a buildup of a compounded exponential growth over time that we just missed when we weren't looking. And by then, it's too late, it's too much. So when we're in a world like this, we're traveling on a curvy road. So what do we need to do? We need to look short and look long. So how do we do that? Well, Danella Meadows, she in her eye-opening book, I love it, highly recommend it, Thinking in Systems, she says, to see systems as a whole, you gotta admit ignorance and be willing to be taught. Taught by whom? By each other, by the system. And she's optimistic, as well as I, when she says, it can be done, and it's exciting when it happens. So, together today, let's see how we can do this. How can we learn from each other and from the system? In that same book, Don Michael is quoted, psychologist, and he says that error embracing and uncertainty are personal qualities. They are necessary for that condition of learning. Embrace errors, embrace uncertainty in our complex world. So let's put these things together. For the rest of the talk, I'll talk about tools that we can actually use to embrace uncertainty, embrace error, learn from each other, and learn from the system. In order to, so that we can fulfill the responsibilities as technologists, as leaders in our society. Are you guys ready? Yes? Okay, let's get started with number one, embrace uncertainty. So, how many of you have found yourselves in the middle of a debate? Something as simple as, this is a green circle. No, it's not a green circle. Yeah, it's a green circle. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Okay, well, Jane Logic provides us a way to reconcile these situations by having us consider pluralities, the coexistence of multiple truths. Given our partial perspectives, it reminds us to perhaps prefix our statements with 
perhaps. But how can this be true? How can this both be a green circle and not be a green circle, you ask? Well, let's think about it. I mean, the border is green, but the inner circle, it's not filled in as green. Or, as a color-blinded individual, they may not be certain that this is green. Also, what is this? This? Do you mean this the sentence? Do you mean this the slide? Do you mean the shape within the slide? As you can see, there are these levels of uncertainty and different perspectives that, we that come into play. But this logic, it doesn't stop at this duality. It's a plurality. At times, there are even more uncertain there's even more uncertainty because the value is indeterminate. For example, we may not have the right tool to measure whether their circle is actually a circle or slightly oval. I mean, I know because I created the slide and know it's not actually a circle. It, the width and height were not equal <laughs> intentionally. In fact, this logical system and analysis, it unfolds to seven different combinations. It's sevenfold logic. And the combination in the middle, it speaks to the coexistence of all three at once. Yes, from some standpoints, it is a green circle. From other standpoints, it's not a green circle. And from another standpoint, it's not possible to tell. This type of logic, it leads to increased empathy. That's where we strive to understand and learn from each other. I want to share another tool with you as well. This is a tool to calibrate your own certainty confidence. Many of us, we tend to be overconfident, including myself, in my, and you know, in, when we make assessments and statements. Some of us, we may be underconfident. So there, you know, a tool that helps us calibrate that could be useful. This book by Hubbard, uh, How to Measure Anything, has excellent exercises in the back. Highly recommend. For us today, I'll have us go through this mini exercise. I'll give you statements about the pandemic. And for each of those statements, think for yourself. Is a statement true or false? But more importantly, think about what is, how certain are you? Are you 50% certain that it's true or false? Are you 80% or 100% confident? OK? Do you guys want to try this with me? OK. So um, let's start. Number one, US consumers purchased more vehicles in the first year of the pandemic compared to the second year of the pandemic. Is that true or false? Think for yourself. And also, how certain are you? Number two, there were more Google searches today for diversity and humanity than there were before the pandemic started. True or false? This is according to the Google tre Trends. How certain are you? True or false? Number three, US mortality rates were more strongly correlated with socioeconomic status than internet access. Okay, true or false? Everybody ready? You got your answers and confidence levels. Let's see how you did. Number one is false. The auto industry actually sold half a million more vehicles the second year. Yes, you know, you can see that we're all, even though we're all settled in as remote workers, many of us moved out of urban areas into rural areas, and so they ended up selling more cars. Number two is also false. Yes, while there was a short time when there was a spike of more searches for diversity and humanity, eventually it regressed back to the previous stats. By the way, on the side, search stats for profit, profit that remained steady and doubly strong than these terms. Number three is also false. 
Surprisingly, it was actually internet access that was the only factor associated with high mortality rate across all geographic locations in the US, whether rural, urban, suburban. That is, regardless whether of your age, of your education, of your economic status, um, your internet access is actually was more of a determining factor of whether or not you survived the pandemic. Just think about what that means as technologists and how, the impact that we have. Well, so coming back to your certainty level, how did you all do? So what you can do is you can add up your certainty expectations and see how it actually compared to the actual. For example, if you were 80% confident for each of them, that's 0.8 times 3, so 2.4. And in order then, so you would need to get all three of them correct to say that you are not overly confident. Now, if you did well, don't think too much of it because this is just a very small size, sample size of questions. Um, I highly recommend, it's a worthwhile formal exercise for you to do this at some point with more questions. And you can leverage the book for that. So that was about embracing uncertainty. Let's move on now to embracing error. For me, I like to use the Knaven framework as a tool to assess the type of error embracing that's needed for a given situation. So I don't know, how many of you guys have seen the Knaven framework before? OK, some of you. Very few. So let's go through and talk through what these four quadrants mean. We'll start with the bottom right quadrant, simple. In simple, there is a very clear relationship between cause and effect. These are the known knowns. One quadrant up is complicated. This is when things start getting less clear. Here, you can rely on data for pre-analysis, or you can even leverage a domain expert. These are the known unknowns. And then you get to complex. Things get even less clear. Here now, clarity is only in hindsight. OK, and the best thing to do at this point is to probe and experiment first, see what happens, and then you can respond. This is where the unknown unknowns are. And then finally, you got chaotic. In chaotic, there's no connection between cause and effect. There's, it's like a crisis, and nobody knows what to expect. And the best thing you could do is just act first. So let's see if you guys got this, OK? Let's take these four situations, and let's place them in these four quadrants. It's one-to-one -one mapping, so <laughs> you can rely on that. Let's start with pandemic. Where would pandemic go? It's unpredictable, right, how people will behave. There's uncertainty about the contagion factor of the virus, et cetera. And by, after all, it's a pandemic, right? So we'll put it in chaotic. What about a new repository? Where, what is that? Where would that go? Well, these days, right, in your organization, it's kind of straightforward. There's usually a runbook that you can just follow to be able to create a, a repository. So it's relatively simple. Now we've got two things left, API security and new feature. Where would we place those? Well, API security, yes, it can be difficult. But with careful analysis, and maybe here too, leveraging a domain expert, you can actually do it. It's actually that new feature that might be more complex. Because who knows how people are going to use it? Who knows the behavior of the society that will change as a result of this new feature? Who knows what the higher order system interconnections will be? So as you can see, this Knaven framework, it helps us determine when and how to embrace errors for different situations. Building upon that, if you find yourself in a complex system where you need to probe first and experiment first, here's another tool. It's called a hypothesized problem statement. How many of you have heard of this? Okay. 
So yeah, hopefully this talk is good because I don't see as many hands going <laughs> up. So tools for you guys to take away with. Um, with a hypothesized problem statement, up front, we can treat our complex work as an experiment. And we're clear with our stakeholders of our uncertainty, and together we're willing, we have a willingness to measure our errors. For example, for this talk, I believe that learning tools for systems thinking will result in a balanced, sustainable growth in our society and we'll know we succeeded when the number of empowered tech responsible technologists and leaders increase. Okay, so that was about embracing error. We'll move on to number three, learning from each other. Now, there are so many different frameworks outside about communications and strengthening our interactions with others and so forth, and they're all fundamentally rooted in humility and thinking of people, people's behavior as outcomes of systems. Personally, I've leveraged nonviolent communication, also called NVC for short. I've leveraged NVC at home, at work, with family, with communities. Let me share a story with you. Two years ago, I used NVC to facilitate a conversation between a strongly principled open source leader with an open source library author. The leader wanted to make sure that the author's new library would support merge rights for multiple people in the community. This is principle-minded open source. The author, however, pushed back. For him, this library it was a foundation for his monetary bread and butter. And before our NBC session, they're, they're, the debate kept going back and forth, back and forth, with each of them talking past each other. So using the structure of NBC's framework, I was able to have them articulate their underlying needs. And most importantly, have them reflect back to each other what they heard from the other side. Only once they spoke out loud the standpoint of the other person did they start seeing the bigger picture and this larger system and where each other was coming from. So as you can see, like myself personally, I've been very fortunate to see firsthand the, and multiple times, how NBC can really transform, transform relationships. There's a tool I use, you can find your own tool as well, but it is possible. It is possible. So moving on, that was learning from each other. Let's move on to learning from the system. Now, with complex systems, you cannot rely on a single human's perception, right? I hope by now that's something that we've all collectively agreed on, and from our own experiences as well. What you want to do with the complex systems is you want to Feel the beat of the system. You want to start dancing with it. And a structured way to get to that is to develop a map. Maps help us create and share mental models with each other. Ronald Heifetz from the Harvard Kennedy School, he uses the term, you know, getting a balcony perspective. Or, you know, as we say, you know, seeing the forest from the trees. So as examples, I'm going to very quickly go through two different frameworks, Wardley maps and DDD models. A Wardley map lets you see the landscape of your business and industry from a bird's eye view. The vertical axis, it positions the value to your customer. The horizontal axis maps the maturity state in its evolution in the industry. So typically, the, the industry offerings, they move from early ideas and genesis to products and commodities. And what we'll do is, we'll very quickly, I'll go through five different aspects just so you can see how the map could be used. Purpose, landscape, climate, doctrine, leadership. Very quickly, we'll just go through this today. Well, first you start with purpose. You know, what needs are you addressing for your customers? 
Then you can start drawing out the offerings that address those customer needs. And you place these offerings on the map. How valuable is it to the customer right? on the y-axis? Is it a differentiator for you and the industry? Is it in the genesis? Or is it a commodity in your industry today? And then you can add to the map what, other, what are others doing in the industry? What are they offering in the same space? How are they changing the game today? So that's the climate in which your business is. And then you can start leveraging the map to make decisions. Like, for example, which things do you want to build versus buy versus rent? And finally, you can make strategic decisions based on the movements that you see or the movements that you want to make possible. For example, do you want to expose more value to your customers in your existing differentiated offerings in the genesis phase? Or do you want to take an offering that's currently custom built and move it to the productization phase? Worley Map, it provides a structured way to discuss this wider landscape you know, with others, with your stakeholders, so that you can make long-term decisions. Another useful mapping tool is domain-driven design with event storming. And I won't have time to go into details for it today, but I'm using it this quarter to help a client align their parts of their product engineering organization. They have a large complex system with multiple legacy components built over multiple decades by multiple teams. So event storming is an efficient way and structured way to get people across the organization and across functions to converge on a common ground. Finally, this leads to our last chapter of responsibility. How many of us have been at companies where we, they speak about flywheels? They're popularized by Amazon. Yeah? So, you know, when you design a business's flywheel, you can have different elements of the business reinforce each other. And this can lead to compounded growth. However, as we know from experiences, continual unchecked growth eventually leads to downfall. So here again, we can leverage wisdom from our ancestors, the yin and yang from Eastern Asian philosophy. These dual forces are interconnected and work together in harmony. You can think of the S-curve in the middle as the dynamics of continual change. The yang on the left depicts the positive reinforcing force of change, just like in the flywheel. However, for long-term sustainability, the yin on the right is a counterforce, and that ensures a continual equilibrium. Yes, even for seven generations or more. But in systems thinking, we call it a balancing feedback loop. So let's go through an example to see how we can design our systems as such. So imagine that you're in a business that wants to retain customers by building an engaging uh, product. Maybe think about Netflix. So you can invest in, a pro in product features that increase engagement, and that can further um, uh, you know, increase the number of subscription renewals that you have, which can increase the revenue, which then you further invest in product, and so forth. So it's this fl uh, flywheel effect. But left unchecked, it can lead to unintended consequences. For instance, maybe your customer's health starts suffering because they're engaged way too much. Or maybe their customer's wealth also suffers because it's impacting their productivity at work. This is not only detrimental to your own business, this is long-term profitability, it's also detrimental to humanity. And so by adding limits, the yin to the yang of the flywheel, we create a much more balanced and sustained system. We don't let our customers over-engage anymore, because if they reach the limit that we've set or they've set for themselves, we nudge them to pause. And now there's a balancing loop that's intentional, and it benefits both profitability and humanity. Another tool that I found recently for becoming more responsible technologists is this really fun like tarot cards of tech. And during your team's design sessions or pre-planning sessions, you can get your cross-functional teams together. They can pick a card and answer questions. For example, the Mother Nature card asks, if environment was your client, how would your product change? 
And yes, these questions do work. So for instance, like recently, I was in a cross-organization group where we chose not to use blockchain as our solution. We were looking to build a decentralized credential management platform, and Mother Nature was our yin to our yang of considering blockchain at that time. Finally, I'll end on a quote by Maggie Kuhn. Maggie, she was told by higher authority in the 1970s that she must retire at the age of 65. So what did she do? She founded Grey Panthers, an organization to fight against ageism. And she did not stop there. No, she didn't. She dedicated her whole life for other truths. For example, she once engaged with various companies about their products, their profits, their factory conditions. She was seeking truth in advertising, even. So folks, across space-time, do you hear the echo of Maggie's words? Speak the truth, even if your voice shakes. I personally, I have high expectations for us as humans. Yes, we can. We can keep standards high. Speak the truth, even if your voice shakes. What is your truth? What is each of yours truths? Is it what leads to the least harm? Is it for the next seven generations? Whatever it is, if not you, then who? Thank you.